Okay, well, I will go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Jordan Snow and I am the Director of Alumni Relations here at KU Medical Center. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to announce that we are recording this meeting. Um, and I just wanted to give a quick overview of the event details and share a few Zoom tips for how we'll run the event tonight. Um, we will first we'll have leaders from the school give you updates on the School of Health Professions and the new programs. Please mute your mics during this time. After the updates, we'll have a Q&A session by typing questions in the chat. So feel free at any time to test the chat feature now by saying a quick hello to everyone. Um, and we will use that feature here in a little while. Um, now I would like to get the program started by introducing Dr. Abby Oden Akinwantan, our Dean of the School of Health Professions. Um, he has been with us since January of 2016. He was previously the Associate Dean for Research at the College of Allied Health Sciences at Augusta University. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Lagos in 1994, a master's degree in 2000, and a doctoral degree in 2004 from the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. He earned a postgraduate certificate in teaching and learning in higher education from the University of East London in 2005. He earned a master's degree in public health in 2012, followed by a master's degree in business administration in 2015 from Augusta University in Georgia. Dr. Akin Wanton is a world leading authority on the use of virtual reality technologies to improve daily living activities in neurologically impaired persons. He has authored more than 110 peer reviewed publications and abstracts in eight book chapters. He is a recipient of the prestigious United States Fulbright Scholarship to Nigeria in 2013 and a Fulbright Specialist Award to Iceland in 2016. He was elected as a fellow of the Association of Schools Advancing Health Professions in October of 2020. So with all of that, um, further ado, Dr. Akinwantan, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Jordan, and uh, welcome to everyone, uh, alumni of the School of Health Professions, or let me say alumni of Allied Health and School of Health Professions. Since many of you um, were affiliated with the institution when it was Allied Health. And it's one of the questions we have received and we will talk about that uh, in due course during the, um, as the Zoom meeting goes on. And, but now we are the School of Health Professions and we are proud uh, to represent you at this time. Um, a lot, you will be hearing from each of the chairs and details on how we have been able to cope uh, during this interesting 2020. I always started my speech to the student groups when I was welcoming them uh, into the new academic year that nobody would have had the right crystal ball as of January 1st, 2020, to predict that this is how 2020 would have uh, unfolded. Yet, I always encouraged our students to realize that as human beings, we are very resilient and irrespective of what challenges nature throws at us, we have what it takes inside of us to stand up to those challenges and continue to move on. Uh, my father would always tell me, it doesn't matter what difficulties you face now, you're probably not the first person to experience it and you will not be the last. If we look back in history, there have also been very challenging times uh, that we have experienced. The reality is this will not be the end. There, is, there are gonna be future challenges, but the one thing that we keep are having is our resilience as human beings to continue to plow through those difficult times and come out on the other end of it successful. And that we have done exceedingly well uh, as a school. And I, I just was uh, going to pull up um, 
the newsletter, the current newsletter that our school uh, released. And that is, um, I, I hope you all have uh, received a copy of that. But uh, Jordan, am I able to share my screen? Yes, yes, you should be able to share it. Okay, I'm going to put it up and I'm going to read just a part of it to you. Sorry, can you all see my screen? And I'm going to read a part of it to you, uh, two, two different um, aspects of uh, the front greeting. And it says, I thank all the faculty, staff, and students of the school in the School of Health Professions for their resilience, flexibility, and cooper cooperation during this difficult time. Our school successfully adapted to all the challenges that came our way in the last few months. We came together as a group and remain focused on our mission to serve the citizens of Kansas, the region, the nation, and to develop tomorrow's leaders through exemplary education, research, and service. While we still have a long road ahead, I truly believe that we collectively have what it takes to rise to those challenges. And the last part of uh, the welcome uh, letter is, and it is very true, I could not be prouder to call the School of Health Professions home. I have no doubt that we will continue to adapt as needed to successfully overcome all our future challenges. I offer my best wishes to all our faculty, staff, and students for successes throughout this uh, new academic year. Our faculty continue to do great work we have been very flexible in adapting to the current academic demands and bringing back our students. Not only did we graduate all our students at the right time in May, we have continued to fill all the positions that are available in the School of Health Professions. I think we successfully conducted more than uh, 15 recruitments during this period and we continue to recruit uh, individuals that are highly, highly qualified to be in the positions that they currently um, occupy. Our research uh, infrastructure continues to grow strong, but one of the things we're really very proud of during this time are the accomplishments of our students. Our students, not only have they also been very flexible to make necessary adaptations to deal with the current um, new method of learning, from virtual world to half presence on campus, half, half, um, half presence in, uh, um, on the virtual world, the use of face masks all the time you go around and the inability to be able to socially integrate with one another as students are known to do. Yet, in spite and despite all of these challenges, we truly celebrate the accomplishments of our students in the latest newsletter. And some of them is what I am scrolling through. Now we have students representing each of our departments to show that as a school, we are plowed together as one indiv indivisible entity. And we have been able to achieve more successes simply because we've worked together and the level of cooperation could not have been better than any other time. But I think as we scroll down the students' accomplishments, the other two things I would like to highlight are the fact that uh, we continue by the numbers shows the amount of scholarships and awards we continue to give our students. And even in these challenging times, we continue to do our best to support the students, to help them have two things were most important to us during this period, the safety of our students and the quality of the education they received from us. And what we have heard back from the students have been nothing but appreciations for what the faculty and staff have been able to do to ensure that their education continues to go on well. Along those lines, I really want to use this opportunity to introduce to you four new programs that we were able to start during this period uh, that you, a good number of our alumni may not have been uh, aware of. We started the doctorate of clinical in laboratory science 
as well as the Doctorate of Clinical Nutrition. What is really spectacular and unique about these two programs is they are the first of its type in the Midwest and the third of its type in the entire country. So we, which really makes us uh, a, a pace setting school. We also, of course, started the Masters of Science in Athletics Training and welcomed uh, the program director, Dr. Leslie Taylor, uh, who has hit the ground running and making significant progress. During this pandemic period, we were also approved to start a Masters of Science in Genetics Counseling. And with that, we continue to keep our program strong. Unprecedented, we have five faculty who went through uh, uh, different forms of promotion. This is the highest number we've had as a school going through uh, faculty promotions. And we're really very proud of their accomplishments. Personally, as, a, uh, as an individual, um, we also, sorry, before I go on, we also had leadership promotions. Dr. Dave Burnett became the full as, uh, associate dean for faculty practice and community partnerships. Uh, Dr. Doris Sabata became the full uh, chair of the Department of Occupational Therapy Education. And uh, before I say, before I read out what is in the blue letter, I would say I want to give a personal shout out and I want you all to join me in appreciating and acknowledging the significant contributions of Dr. Susan Carlson as our Associate Dean for Research. We are in the best ever position research has been in the School of Health Professions. We have grown research productivity in the school 17 fold and that is highly significant. And it is under the leadership of Dr. Susan Carlson. However, Dr. Susan Carlson is always uh, interested in new challenges and will be stepping down as the Associate Dean uh, for Research in the School of Health Professions. She's still with us, she's still our faculty, she's still our university distinguished professor. She will continue to offer our services and continue to help us grow um, in research and in other aspects. And I'm happy at this time to introduce uh, Dr. Jake Sosnoff uh, to you, who will occupy the position of the Associate Dean for Research come February 15, uh, 2021. And when we have another alumni meeting, we would have the opportunity to further introduce uh, Dr. Jake Sosnoff better. But at this time, I really want to end by saying a big thank you to all of your alumni whose support continue to make it possible for us to do the things we do. Uh, in speaking with Christy Gangnon and Jordan Snow, our contacts in the alumni office, I understand this is the highest number of alumni that we've ever had in the School of Health Professions. And having uh, a virtual event with about 43 persons in attendance is quite incredible. But again, I really just want to say, read this letter out to all of you to show my level of appreciation. And it is to the associate deans, Susan Carlson, Jeff Radell, and Dave Burnett, as well as the department chairs, uh, Dr. Eric Helsinghorst, Tiffany Johnson, Patricia Cludin, Rosen McLean, Dr. Knight, Dr. Doris Abata, Dr. Deborah Sullivan, and our latest administrator, Dr. Leslie Taylor. And I said, your steadfast guidance and leadership during this time have been more than remarkable. Our ability to come together and quickly adjust to the constantly changing circumstances has been one of our strengths. We have had our work cut out for us, but we have continued to put the well being of our faculty, staff, and students at the forefront of our minds. The School of Health Professions has continued to function at the highest levels throughout these challenging times. Last spring, we successfully graduated 304 students remotely. We depopulated and repopulated research lab spaces. We recruited exceptional faculty and students for the new academic year. I have no doubt that we will continue to accomplish more together. I look forward to a day when we can gather in person to celebrate our achievements. Until then, please accept my sincere gratitude for all the time, effort, and hard work that you continue to give our school every day. Alumni, I cannot say it enough. We need to be proud of the hard work our leadership have done. They have been wonderful. They have been magnanimous. 
and we could not have accomplished anything we did without their contributions. So please join me in thanking the leadership of the School of Health Professions who make it possible for us to proudly continue to represent you as your alma mater and as the institution and the school that we hope you will continue to be proud of. Thank you. All right, Dr. Akinwantan, would you like to call um, on our first presenter, Eric Helsinghorst? Well, Dr. Harry Kelsinghorst, it's over to you. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> thank you Dr. Kinwantan. Hello, everyone. It's good to see everybody here, and thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. And it's a it, uh, Dr. Kinwantan is putting and Jordan are putting a great deal of trust in us because um, as as a department chairs, we like to talk. And, and so we will have to make sure that we, we bring ourselves in. And so uh, I thank you again for being here. And I, it, um, I am Eric Elsinghorst. I'm the chair of the Clinical Laboratory Sciences Department. And uh, it's an exciting time for us for the, for the department. Um, we, we, have, um, we have added two, uh, we have added a new uh, program, doctoral program to our list of programs that are offered through the department. Um, and that is the Doctorate of Clinical Laboratory Sciences. Uh, the, um, we still have our, under, our undergraduate bachelor's degree program in clinical laboratory science because that is still the entry level for um, laboratorians in the clinical laboratory. And the lab is a very important part of the healthcare team, even though we're behind the scenes, about 70% of all medical decisions are based on a laboratory value. And so um, it's important that the laboratory be present in a consultant role for clinicians and physicians and other members of the healthcare team because the, 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 um, the test menu for clinical laboratory tests is expansive and growing all the time, particularly with the addition of, of genetic testing. And so it's a difficult question to know what is the right test for the right patient at the right time. And so uh, the doctor of clinical laboratory sciences is gonna, sciences is gonna be the person who is out there in the with healthcare team at the, at the arm of the physician and the other members of the healthcare team, um, providing guidance on, on test utilization and interpretation so that we're improving the patient experience and, and improving patient outcomes. So that will uh, be beneficial both for the patient and for the healthcare team in general. Not only are we working with the healthcare team, but we're also working with patients themselves and their families. We are a great data dumper, um, and but how does what does it mean when you get a particular value, and what does it impact? How does this impact your health? What should you be doing differently? What should be done next? And so um, the DCLS is going to be an important part of the healthcare team. And as Dr. Kinwatan mentioned, we're very excited because we are the um, there are only three current uh, programs um, DCLS programs in the country, and uh, and so we're proud to be on the vanguard of this uh, aspect of clinical education. Um, and so um, we have our, we've uh, entered two years uh, into the cohort, uh, of a two second cohort has started this fall. And, um, and so things are going really smoothly with that program. Um, uh, we are also excited about the master's in genetic counseling. Um, as I met, uh, the genetics is a very rapidly growing aspect of healthcare. And uh, what is the meaning and what's the interpretation of those genetic tests um, and working with individuals to help them understand the impact of genetic information on their health. That's the role of the genetic counselor. And so we were really, really pleased to have the Kansas Board of Regents approve a genetic counseling program for the University of Kansas uh, Medical Center. And it will be housed in the Department of Clinical Laboratory Sciences. Uh, we just received that approval in June of this year. And we are uh, about to begin our search for a program director who will then uh, be taking the charge um, of, of that curriculum development and hiring faculty. Um, it is itself, there's only 49 approved programs in the United States, none in Kansas. Um, and so we're looking forward to contributing to that member of the healthcare team as well, uh, because there is a, a dire shortage of genetic counselors across the country. And so I will rein myself in and stop talking uh, so that uh, someone else can, uh, the next uh, department chair can, can talk about what's going on in the department. 
questions. Thank you for, thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about things that are happening. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Elsinghurst. Uh, please, if you have any questions, just, uh, you can put it on the chat line and we will take the questions as we go on. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Patricia Cludin uh, to go next. Patty? Yeah, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's so nice to see. Uh, I see several friendly faces and familiar faces from um, our former students, former faculty, uh, spanning uh, you know the years that we've been involved in, in our physical therapy and rehab science programs. Um, the biggest, I guess, news I would say uh, this past year was that our physical therapy program increased in our national rankings from ninth to sixth out of public uh, physical therapy programs across the country, which you can kind of argue whether or not, uh, you know, how meaningful that is uh, from a kind of a scientific perspective, but it does mean something to uh, students who are looking for PT programs. And we've actually seen a bump in the number of applicants this year, um, which isn't the case nationwide. Nationwide, there's kind of been a slow gradual decline for the past few years, but we had an increase so far this year. Um, so that's exciting. And we also have, uh, you know, exciting things happening with our rehab science program. We're graduating uh, people who have PhDs and who are uh, serving faculty roles across the country and, and internationally. Um, but tonight, I wanted to really highlight uh, the newest change in our department, which is adding the Masters of Science and Athletic Training program. We had an opportunity when the uh, Bachelor's in Athletic Training program at Lawrence uh, was closing and uh, potentially moving to the Health Science campus. And so we embraced that opportunity and we knew that in order to have a, a world-class program, uh, which is what Dr. Gerard had uh, given us that directive to do, we needed a world-class program director. And we found that person in Dr. Leslie Taylor, who we were so happy to recruit here to lead this new program. She's an incredible amount of experience coming from Texas Tech. And, um, and I told her that I would give her a few minutes to really tell you about the, the new program that will be um, admitting students for next summer. So, uh, Leslie? Great. Thank you all very much. And, you know, I'm thrilled to be back at KU. I um, started my um, career as an athletic trainer or my education as an athletic trainer um, at KU um, back when it was an apprenticeship program. So, um, you know, the profession has come a long way and, and I'm glad to have come full circle. Um, for those of you who don't know, athletic trainers are part of the healthcare team or healthcare professionals. We provide really a continuum of care from prevention to return to activity um, and kind of everything in between. And while most people associate athletic training with those who, you know, run out on the football field on Saturday or Sunday when somebody gets hurt, um, athletic trainers also work in the performing arts and with the military and um, in physician practice and outpatient clinics and um, public safety, fire and, and police. And so really a wide variety of practice settings. So it makes being located in the School of Health Professions and the Department of Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Science in Kansas City, um, such a great place to be because there's the availability of resources um, across the metropolitan area. We are considering this as a building on the great work that was done at the undergraduate level. Um, our accrediting body made a switch to a um, master's degree for the entry level credential. And so that is, um, and that program should be housed with other healthcare professions, which makes, again, our location perfect um, for that. So we are a two year program, six semesters, 68 credit hours. Um, our students will take, the athletic training students will take um, all or part of 10 courses with the DPT students. So we're really excited to be, have that um, automatic interprofessional um, collaboration and, and exposure of our students as well as the faculty then working side by side um, to teach those students. Clinical experiences will be both locally as well as in their second year, they can um, do immersive experiences really anywhere. Um, and so we're excited to um, not only use um, contracts and experiences that have been used before, um, but also to build on that. And so I'm really looking to, to reach out and, and find new locations and some alternative practice settings that maybe we don't have in this area. 
So, um, you know, again, just super excited to be here and lots of work to do. We are um, in the process of hiring faculty. We've hired our first faculty who will start in January. So I'm very excited about that. And then we have a current search going on for our director of clinical education. And that individual will um, hopefully be on board in um, July or August of next year, 21. And um, we have application open for students and hoping to have, not hoping, we will have students starting in the summer. And so um, if you know anybody who's interested, let us know. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you, Dr. Leslie Taylor. Uh, now I have the opportunity to uh, ask Dr. Deb Sullivan to tell us about the updates on Dr. Clinical Nutrition. Sure, well, um, great to see everyone tonight. And as Dina Kinwinton mentioned, we did start a Doctor of Clinical Nutrition. So this is a professional doctorate, so an advanced practice degree for practicing dietitians to increase their clinical skills and their leadership skills. We would like them to be the, the leaders and the drivers of clinical care, nutrition care. So we're excited by this. We have six students that started this fall and we've got about four new ones that will start in the spring. And then hopefully we'll have, um, our goal is to have 12 starting next um, fall. And, um, and so far the program is going well. We just to, you know, um, remind you, you know, we started a, a PhD program about 10 years, ago, 10 years ago. So that's a PhD program in medical nutrition science. And so that is training the new researchers that are out, you know, doing, continuing to do great research um, at, you know, academic centers. And we also have our, still have our flagship dietetic internship and our on-campus master's degree, as well as our online master's degree. And we also do have a certificate, an online certificate in dietetics and integrative medicine. So that's what's happening at, uh, in dietetics. Sorry, thank you, Dr. Sullivan. At this time, I will introduce both uh, Drs. Dave Burnett and Dr. Lisa Trujillo, uh, who will give us an update on respiratory care and diagnostic sciences. Dr. Burnett. Thank you, Dean Kenwaton. So, and welcome everyone to the first We cannot hear you anymore. Can uh, can you hear me okay now? Or yes. is my or is spectrum not working that well today? We all good? All right, we'll, we'll give it another go. Um, well, I'm assuming that most of you are here today because you're a proud Jayhawk. And I would have to say that um, I, I certainly am as well, working with uh, the, the folks that you, we have on the call today and all of the other faculty we have in our school I think everyone's heard that that whole phrase of, you know, true character really shines during challenging times. And as you all know, we, we certainly have some challenging times right now. And it's been uh, it's been very pleasant to work with the dean and, and the, the faculty and, and the folks on the call today uh, throughout the, these times because they, their true character has, has truly shined. And I'm I'm sitting here with you today as well as being a proud Jayhawk also. So. I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, respiratory care and diagnostic sciences. The department's made up of about five different programs, actually. Two of those are in respiratory care and three in diagnostic science. Uh, there's really major new program or degree initiatives within all five of the, of the programs. So first in the diagnostic science program, which is actually made up of cardiovascular science and then diagnostic ultrasound and vascular technology. And then a third program within diagnostic science is the nuclear medicine technology. These three programs in diagnostic science were approved by the board of regents for transitioning from the certificate program to an actual bachelor's of science degree. We're currently finalizing that curriculum for the, for those, uh, programs to become all degree granting programs. And we should be accepting our first cohort, I believe around the fall of 2022 is when our first cohort will, uh, will start. Uh, this move to the bachelor's degree for these uh, certificate programs was in, in response really to uh, two main needs. 
first of all, the certificate programs uh, have a very robust curriculum uh, requirement, and that's per their accrediting organizations uh, requirements as well. And it's necessary for these students to complete one to two years of didactic and clinical training, depending on their specialization. So as you can see, as, as CERT programs, it was, it, was, it was time, you know, to work on developing a, a, uh, a stronger academic presence for them and move them towards a bachelor's degree. Also, many of these students are actually returning to these certificate programs, and now they will be, of course, degree granting programs in, in, in the near future after completing a four-year degree and spending a brief time in the workforce elsewhere. So our plan is really to capture these students earlier, introduce them to these undergraduate programs that are available, available to them. And uh, therefore we're building the two plus two program model that will allow these uh, students to enter undergraduate uh, training and hopefully complete their degree in four years and, and not have to circle back around and spend more money and time. So next I'd like to speak just briefly about the, the positive initiatives, initiatives in respiratory care. Uh, we've added a dual degree program that is the first within the profession in the United States. This program allows students who are enrolled in a regionally accredited community college to actually earn credits towards their bachelor's degree. And then when they're finished with their community college training, they can matriculate into our degree advancement program. This allows those students to actually remain in their community, enter into the workforce, uh, where they're close to the, uh, where they live or actually in the same town that they live in. So then turn, we hope that this will definitely enhance the RT workforce throughout the state of Kansas and some of those needed rural areas. And this new program is actually in very good hands. It's coordinated by one of our fine respiratory care education faculty by the name of Cheryl Skinner. So there's another program I'd, I'd like to uh, announce as well, but I'm certainly gonna turn that over into someone with better hands to do so. Um, and it, this, this person is the Lisa Trujillo, and she's the program director for the respiratory care education program. And she will then discuss a, another exciting program. So Lisa, could you go ahead and take it away? Thank you, Dr. Burnett. It's very exciting to be here with you all this evening. Um, and as, as Dave mentioned, we have some great things going on within the respiratory care program. Uh, one of the things, I'm, I'm new to KU um, in 2018. And um, when I came to the campus and began as program uh, director, we uh, looked at adding a community global health course. And considering that our, the students that we graduate as healthcare providers are not citizens, but they're really global citizens, and they're going to be engaging uh, with patients that are of diverse culture and ethnicity and socioeconomic background. And we see that uh, definitely in the diversity that exists within the metro area of Kansas City and then out in the rural areas. Um, we know that they need to be able to appropriately respond to patients regardless of age and gender and orientation and limitations and mental capacity and so on and so forth. And so we uh, built this class as a required course within the program, and it explores population health and burden of disease and health and human rights related topics, uh, traditions of health around the world. So we look at not only what's local uh, within Kansas, um, but, but really globally on all of these topics, uh, looking at rural health disparities. So I would argue that the some of the disparities that exist in rural areas of Kansas are also experienced uh, across the country and really around the world. Um, the global mental health issues um, and challenges that are faced there. socio determinant and that's kind of an overview of what's kind of covered in this course. But we felt it was important for our students to graduate um, having had a little bit of education in this area. So we created the course as a three credit hour course and it's available um, to undergraduate students and then also to graduate students uh, across our health professions. So we're very excited for that. And we've been able to have um, a number of students from our occupational therapy uh, master's program take this course, which really adds to the diversity of the conversation in our discussions um, and also um, support, supports their educational goals. So um, 
This course is, like I mentioned, is required for all direct entry students. So our bachelor degree seeking respiratory care students, and then all students that are coming back for degree advancement, it's a requirement for them as well. So for our on-campus students, they do it as a traditional six week course, but those that are joining us uh, in an online fashion get to take it in a condensed eight week um, course as, as half of a semester. So we've been doing um, the face-to-face -face courses since spring of 19, and we started our uh, eight-week courses fall of last year. So we found some great success in that. I've learned a lot, I'll tell you, to, to have the students um, do the work that they do and bring the experience. A lot of our degree advancement students are from all over the country. And so we get a lot of um, feedback from where they're working and, and some of their experiences in their travels and so on. So uh, as I mentioned, it's open to all students. It's not limited to just respiratory therapy students. And so uh, a couple of the cup, um, interesting things that we're doing with this course, um, one is to try and offer optional experiences for our students to connect to rural parts of Kansas. And we've been working with uh, Seward County Community College in Southwest Kansas to create um, a rural health component to our students' clinical um, summer clinical uh, application. So uh, what they will do, we're hoping that this will begin in the, the summer of 2021, and that they would travel to Southwest Kansas, connect with their fellow respiratory care peers at, um, in Seward County and uh, participate in clinical rotations at critical access, access hospitals um, and really be able to apply some of what they've learned um, and see firsthand what rural healthcare looks like. Um, and then they would also participate with some community uh, health activities in partnership with the local students there. The other portion of this is really preparing students for an international education experience. And we've been fortunate to be able to take some of our uh, students from not only respiratory care, uh, but occupational therapy and nursing with us to Ghana and to have an experience there. We, we travel largely the entirety of the country from, from very densely populated uh, urban areas to rural health uh, or rural areas. And we have great partners. It's, it's an, um, a program that's been established for over 15 years. And so we're able to really put our students in an environment where they can learn from their colleagues um, in these settings. So that's a little bit about the Community and Global Health course and, and kind of the far reaching aspects of it beyond just the classroom. So thank you very much for your time. Well, uh, thank you very much for all the presenters. I'll hand it over back now to Jordan. All right. Yes, I will echo those. Um, thanks. Thank you for everybody for giving us the, the inside scoop here tonight. Um, so now we are going to open it up to questions. And we had a few submitted before the event. So we'll get started with those. Um, but I look, it looks like we do have a question in the chat, so please feel free um, to type your questions in the chat and we will get to those in a few minutes. Um, and make sure that when you are typing in the chat to um, address to everyone so that we can all see them. Um, okay, so uh, questions submitted prior to the event. The first one is, how many students are in each of the departments? Kind of a loaded question, but uh, shoot, I hope I can uh, try go over that. Each of the chairs, please correct me. Uh, it's really a very um, the numbers are staggered all over the place. What I know is that I think uh, we have about 721 students in total. And for sure, in the last five years, the School of Health Professions has been the only school that has been increasing in numbers uh, of student recruitment for five straight consecutive years. And with the addition of the Masters of Science in Athletics training with the new programs, we have added the Doctorate of Clinical Nutrition, Clinical Laboratory Science, and um, all the other new programs, the number will just continue to increase. 
uh, for the School of Health Professions, which is really uh, very good. Now, in each class, it's almost difficult to come up with uh, a specific number. I can tell you capacities. Uh, PT uh, has 60 students in uh, the uh, doctorate of physical therapy class and have between 10 and 20 PhD students. Am I correct, Dr. Flutie? Okay. Uh, occupational therapy has about 42 students per class and will have between seven and 10 PhD students. Uh, clinical laboratory science between all three programs, I think we're about 30, Dr. Ossingars? Uh, total with all the various programs, we're at 64. Okay, 64. And Dr. Sullivan? I can do the math, but quickly thinking about it, I bet we're about 75. Yes, plus the PhD students, right? Yeah, so uh, that's that. Uh, who else is on? Dr. Johnson? Uh, in respiratory care, Dr. Burnett? Yeah, we have approximately 80 to 85 at any any semester due to the degree advancement program that fluctuates with students that are part-time distance learning students and they so that it fluctuates each semester, but approximately 80 to 85. Yeah, and I know, thank you. And I know for hearing and speech on the hearing section in each class, they've been increasing in number 10 and they're going up to, I think, 15 now. Uh, uh, the speech language pathology is a huge number because we have students over from uh, the Lawrence campus as well. So it's uh, really difficult to estimate. Health information management has, I think, about 25, but they also have quite a lot of online uh, students in the program as well. So that's uh, diff uh, uh, also difficult to estimate. For uh, nurse anesthesia, that is always a very clear cut. Uh, it's one of our departments that has grown uh, significantly. It used to be 72 students in total, 24 in each year for three years. And uh, in the last three years, we have started increasing. Uh, the first year we increased by six. And then the second year we increased by 12 plus six, which is 18. Uh, in the third year now we've increased by 12 plus 12 plus six, uh, which is uh, 30. And by next year, they will be increasing by a final six, which will be the total, which will bring a total uh, increment of 36 added on uh, to the 72 to give us 96, if I'm not wrong. Is that correct, Dr. Knight? We will be taking 36 per class. So we currently have 102 students, 30, 102, 36, yeah. and 36. Yeah. Sorry. My maths was off. Yes, that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're, we're really growing by the numbers. Thank you for asking that question. Wonderful. OK, and then how many graduates were there in May 2020? Well, uh, by my last uh, total count, 304 students, not to include about six to eight PhD students that have since graduated after then. So uh, maybe 312-ish. All right, thank you. Um, and then there, there was the question that came in today about, um, is there a way for the school to utilize the old Allied Health logo? Um, so there, they used to use it for respiratory therapy education, um, but there used to be a pin, I think. And, and so someone was just curious what happened um, with that pin and um, what, how the school maybe is branding right now. Uh, you know, uh, it, that's a really tough question. I got that question and I really did not know how to answer it because it's something we never, not really thought of. I would say that uh, we don't even have a good number. We don't even have those pins around anymore. The only um, the only pins I still see around is the blue pin with the uh, uh, for the highlight health sciences, which was actually completely different from the picture uh, the person sent. I can dig further in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Helen, for showing that. Thank you. I, I can dig further and see what we can do. 
I would say for this, okay, yes, that's the one I saw. Yes, I would say for sure that our history is really very important to me. One of the things I did when I started as dean uh, five years ago was did a history of our past deans of the School of Health Professions and College of Allied Health Sciences. And now you can come into the dean's office and you can see the past leadership of the school. I do not have a problem with as many people as have uh, paraphernalia, memorabilia of our past history, like the picture of our, um, uh, of our logo, what it used to be, we can make a collage of uh, the timeline of the different kinds of uh, uh, logo that we have done and display it in a very obvious and conspicuous place in the school so that people can follow the timeline of the things uh, of how we have evolved up to where we are right now. So the only thing I probably can say in response to that is um, it's a project that I'm willing to take on and I would ask as many people as have things that remind us of our good past to please send it to me. And I would see how we make that uh, uh, into an item that we can display proudly in our school. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ellen. So those were, were the questions that were submitted ahead of time. So I'm going to move yeah, over so to the chat. Yeah, there are more questions yeah. uh, on the chat. So, you may so want to um, the first one is what are we doing in inter disciplinary education within the School of Health Professions and with the School of Nursing and Medicine with the goal of understanding unique roles in building healthcare teams? Uh, I wish Dr. Steve Jernigan or Dr. Uh, uh, Dana Bostic were here to tell us about that. But Dr. Radell did represent our school when we won an award for inter- uh, interprofessional education at the uh, Association of Schools Advancing the Health Professions gathering, uh, I think two years ago in St. Petersburg, Florida. And Dr. Adele will talk more about our IEP initiatives. Well, you know, I'm, I've been around long enough to remember when IPE was called interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary or something like that. Um, the impetus or the, the pressure, the, the interest in doing interprofessional education in healthcare has grown by leaps and bounds over the last five to eight years. And I'll tell you, um, KU is way out ahead of that parade. Um, they have um, developed a very focused interprofessional education program. It, is, it involves uh, a almost, I mean, as far as I can tell, everyone on campus uh, all the professions, they have simulated patients, they have mannequins, they have um, um, operating rooms in a just a spiffy uh, simulation environment. And the students really, really appreciate it. One of the advantages of our simulation environment, having it such a well um, developed environment is that um, we were in a much better position last spring to pivot away from hands-on clinical contact to meet accreditation requirements into more of a simulation or um, a virtual environment that I don't think had, had we just gone down the traditional route, we would have been as well positioned to do. Um, part of my favorite activity, I, or at least um, anecdotes, are the ones where the health profession students are the ones who are leading the charge for interprofessionalism. And the um, medical students will say things like, well, I didn't know you did that. Wow, that's really interesting. And really, really have grown to have a better appreciation for a team-based healthcare approach that um, is more pervasive and probably better off um, serving the the uh, the clients, all of the students. I, I don't know of one who hasn't has not said they're feeling more prepared going into the clinic. They feel like they are um, providing better care when they get to the clinic because of the interprofessional experience. I will tell you that one of the feedback we receive regularly is that the real world doesn't play by those rules, and that. Um, 
what we're teaching them as interprofessional behaviors are the way it should be and it's not often the way it is so we also are teaching them how to change the world and i think that's a really good thing thank you dr radell and um just in addition to that we have an iep well uh in 2016 or 2017 the chairs of the school of health professions did move for us to start what we call the IEP champions, in which case every department listed one faculty who would champion the cause of interprofessional education uh, for the department. And we put this team together and they basically also guided us through uh, interprofessional education to the extent that uh, there is uh, one of our faculty, Christy Johnston, who is in charge of some interprofessional education uh, in at the KU Medical Center. And she would continuously send an email back uh, to me and the chairs to appreciate the level of involvement of our uh, faculty and staff, our uh, faculty and students in interprofessional education activities uh, on campus. Uh, the one other thing that you should know is one of our Board of Advocate members, and I think uh, an alum as well, uh, Francis Toner, uh, and her husband uh, did some investment into the clinical laboratory science virtual reality training program at the HEB. And one of the things she insisted on, and I'm glad she did and we made, they made happen, is that it cannot be a facility that trains only clinical laboratory science students. It has to be a facility that train all students at the KU Medical Center in an integrated fashion including medicine, nursing, and all the other departments in the School of Health Professions. And that's how it got started. So I think we're making a lot of landmark accomplishments in the area of interprofessional education. But again, I say a big thank you to Roy Swift because he's always been very particular about that and has always continued to challenge us on how we make our programs interdisciplinary so that we can prepare uh, adequately prepared students for the workforce when they graduate. Thank you, Roy. All right, wonderful. There is a question. Um, are we doing better with utilizing the interprofessional treatment space in the new building? My understanding the last time I was down there was that it was hard to schedule, especially for OT and PT. Well, uh, let me say, Dr. Cludin is here. She's uh, chair of yeah. PT. Let her respond to that. Sure, I can, I can take that. You know, well, right now it's weird because of COVID and, um, you know, the zeal shut down for a while and the whole campus shut down. And so everything's kind of getting back onto um, this previous schedule, but it's not quite up to speed yet. Um, we're still kind of in a priority, only like essential learning activities are really happening on campus. But your, your kind of underlying question about the availability of that space uh, you know, there's been some uh, negotiations and some kind of um, uh, growth, I guess, on both sides and kind of what, uh, how to use that space most effectively. And, and it was clarified that the space, like if we want to, if we want to use the space, we should pro we should be doing interdisciplinary activities, kind of like we were just saying with the CLS lab. Um, although I, for one of my courses in neuro, I do use the space just for my PT students on a couple of occasions. Um, but that's not the priority. The priority is, when, is to, to have learning activities that really benefit multiple groups of students and multiple learners, but those take time to develop. And so it's kind of a long-winded answer to your question, but I, I, at least in PT, it's definitely getting better. We're moving more towards simulations that, like I said, are interdisciplinary that benefit more than one group, either within our school or in other schools, and less, it's, we're, we, there's less enthusiasm, I guess, for kind of one-offs or Things that just benefit our, our groups of students, but they're they're still available. It just it's, you just have to work a little harder to get those those scheduled. They're not the priority, and and we, I think that makes sense. I mean, we kind of understand that. And I, I I don't want to speak for OT because I'm not quite sure what their if their experience has been similar. But so, Doctor uh, Bill, uh, I, I'll tell you. I remember those times when we used to complain about uh, usage and activities there. That has since improved mm -hmm. significantly. 
just as we were making very significant progress, COVID set in and everybody had to get off campus. So it is difficult to really quantify where we would have been at this time. But definitely there has been significant progress uh, compared to the last time when we really, and we needed to, to speak up that we were not making, uh, we were not being utilizing the place in the most uh, 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 efficient way. But that's uh, since, since improved. Um, while we wait for the next question, I would say, I need to really acknowledge the contributions of some of the alumni members who have stepped up to, who have stepped up to continue to help the school by serving on the board of advocates. And I will just go in no particular order, but uh, Roy Swift uh, is one of them. Uh, Bill Howard is another one. Uh, Kitty Reed continues, her, her presence is always, always felt in everything even though she's not a member of the Board of Advocates, but she's always reaching out to us. Uh, Tim Steele is another one on my screen now, and he's one of the newest members of the Board of Advocates. Uh, Cam Wilson, I see on, also always in touch with us and doing great things. Uh, I'll quickly uh, scroll over to the next screen, and I see... Uh, who else? Ah, Paula Woolworth. Paula is on the call. Uh, she's actually the secretary of the Board of Advocates and again, a very strong member. Uh, Lisa Steno -Bittel, uh, Bittel is also one of the members of the Board of Advocates and they have continued uh, to uh, support the school in various ways. In that way, I also want to say a big thank you to Yukiko Ino who is our representative in the endowment office and who I think continues to reach out and continues to help uh, our school uh, get as much uh, endowment contributions to help us continue to give more scholarships to our students. Uh, who else? But I think in general, I just would like to say a big thank you to all of you. Uh, too many names to mention, but all names that I remember and that's because you have all reached out to the school in one form or the other. And again, I would not, uh, I would tell you the uh, role you play in the success we accomplish every day cannot be overemphasized. Your presence, your support, and your best wishes continue to make us strong. And we hope to continue to make you proud that we are the ones who currently fly, uh, uh, fly the flag of the institution that you remain very proud of. I think one email, one, one question came in from Paula. Has SHP suffered any negative in, uh, budget impacts due to COVID or other adverse budget directives from the state or board of regions? The answer absolutely is no, not really. Uh, we have been lucky as an institution, we've not had any significant uh, budget impact. However, we did have a freeze on hiring, and you could still hire very important faculty if you could justify the need for those faculty. I would say we were very, very uh, lucky with that because almost all the just uh, all the positions we needed and we asked for exceptions were granted. Now the uh, the freeze has been lifted. The only negative aspect of per se is we have not been able to talk of salary increases either because of merit or because of general increases because of, I would say because of the COVID. Had we gone on 2020 the way we started, there would have been no doubt in my mind that that would have been part of the discussion. But with respect to what COVID imposed on us, we were not able to discuss that. But I give a lot of credit to the institution as well. The institution stepped up in many ways. When I speak with the deans from the other institutions, I cannot help but realize how much our leadership as an institution has done. For instance, uh, providing PPE materials for the entire school, all department, faculty and staff, not many, very few people, if any, had to pay for any PPE materials, be it cleaning, be it face mask, be it everything, to the extent that I understand we are one of the most generous institutions that provided um, eight face masks 
per individual, be you faculty, staff, or student, each person got eight of those face masks, which is one of the highest I've heard of in the institution in speaking with the other deans. So in spite of the COVID, I think we have done well as an institution and we have done well as a school. I have not seen any major impact of the COVID budget wise that would have said we could have done this, but we did not do it because of the COVID. So we, we've been lucky. Now, join us in praying for a better, for the same or even a better experience next fiscal year. Remember, all the jobs lost this year and the taxes that would be lost as a result of that, the impact will only show up on the next budget year because this budget year was based on last year's income. So we keep our fingers crossed. I know the state is working very hard to not have an impact on higher education or the minimal impact. But still, we're not clearly out of the woods on we will not be impacted at all. So we keep our fingers crossed and see how much that will be. And we will take all the necessary steps to adapt as much as possible. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Oh, this is the last call for questions. I don't, I haven't seen any others come through, um, but if anyone else has any any questions, we can take maybe one or two more. We're a little past six o'clock, but I wanna make sure we address everything. Hey Jordan, there's a question there from Paula. Oh, there is, okay. I think we just went over that. I cannot, about the, the I cannot budget. see any question. I think the only question from Paula was the one I just answered. Yeah, I don't see another one either. Yeah, I'm, I may have read over it. I'm sorry. Yeah, All it's right. the one I just answered. It was the one on the negative impact of the budget. Yeah. I think there's one, I guess, maybe one last thing, if you don't mind touching on about um, some of the questions we've been getting in our alumni office is, is there any long-term changes just um, across the board that you know the school of health professions may implement post covid that you know you've had to adapt and then oh things are going really well we're going to just do things this way on from here on out you know this is not just the school of health professions this mm -hmm. is not just the university of kansas medical center these are all these are almost every workforce would have to recalibrate and really ask when is physical presence really very important and analogous to success? And when can the same level of success be achieved virtually? Academic centers, there's no doubt about it that we would have to invest in more effective virtual uh, learning environments. We're gonna to have to teach our students more about tele-rehabilitation, uh, telemedicine, telehealth, because a lot of consultations are going to be going on now uh, remotely. So the landscape of how things have changed uh, due to the COVID is a real question of how many things can we do virtually versus in person, which is more cost effective and how do we prepare students who are actually um, adequately prepared to engage and continue to do well in that environment. Thank you. I think that that covered everything. Uh, there's just some some thank yous in the chat. And um, so I, I don't have anything else. Um, so Dean, unless you have any any last words, um, thank you everyone for joining us. This was really wonderful. Um, we hope to do it again. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your time. And we appreciate all that you do for us. Okay. Have a good evening. Bye.